Here at Edwards Air Force Base for the landing, everything seems to be in order. The chase planes are now circling in the air, waiting to intercept the descending shuttle. CBS News coverage of the landing of the Space Shuttle Columbia will continue after these messages. And the news from uh, space and the upper reaches of the Earth's atmosphere continues to be good so far as we have it. Astronauts John, uh, uh, Bob Crippen and uh, John Young are in the blackout communications period, have been for a few minutes now. Their spacecraft is in the uh, very heat intense period, uh, making its way back into the lower reaches of the Earth's atmosphere. We are 19 minutes from the scheduled landing time here at Edwards Air Force Base and nine minutes to resuming communications uh, with the astronauts. The uh, touchdown time here at Edwards Air Force Base is uh, scheduled for roughly uh, 10.22, uh, that's West Coast time, uh, in the afternoon, uh, in the morning, and uh, roughly 1.22 Eastern time this afternoon, about 19 minutes from now. Uh, we haven't said a great deal about the uh, astronauts' families. Uh, we know that this is a tension-filled period for them and also a joyous period for them because uh, their men are on their way home. Uh, with Commander John Young, his wife Susie, children Sandy, 23 years old, and John, 21 uh, years old. And we know that uh, they are listening uh, very carefully to all that's going on. And uh, with pilot uh, uh, Bob Crippen, his wife Virginia, and children uh, Ellen, 18, Susan, 16, and Linda, 13. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some version of that uh, of the Navy hymn, that uh, great hymn written by William Whiting, Eternal Father, Strong to Save, uh, that ends, Oh, hear us when we lift our prayer, for those in peril in the air, uh, somebody might be saying some version of that now, would you think? That's possible, and uh, every little bit helps, I've noticed. So uh, <laughs> when people approach you and say they prayed for you, you say, that's nice, maybe it worked. <laughs> you don't ever know what really does it. <laughs> We've talked a lot about the tiles, those uh, 30,000 plus tiles on the Space uh, Shuttle Columbia. The tiles uh, looking like this, this is the outside, this is the inside. These are the key to getting the spaceship through this very dangerous period in which it is now in. Hold on just a moment. Uh, Mission Control has something to say. Let's pick it up. There's been a power failure at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, which may affect the radar and telemetry on the early portions of the signal here. All right, well, that's... Uh... That is no big deal, uh, the power failure of the radar, nobody wanted it to happen, but uh, when he first said it had been a power failure, your heart sort of misses a beat there. But uh, I, sh I should say, by the way, that an especially equipped C-141 jet transport is in the air near Hawaii with an enormous infrared sensitive telescope aimed at the orbiter. The plan is for this aircraft to make a heat map of the orbiter's belly. This information should help in planning future flights and possible changes in the shuttle, including possible changes with the tiles. Now, Leo Krupp, uh, check me if you will here, because you and I have talked about these tiles any number of times. First of all, some changes are going to be necessary, will they not? Because already some of the tiles from uh, this area of the spacecraft, a non-vital area in terms of re-entry, uh, have turned up missing, and, and you say changes have to be made. Well, that's right, Dan. The, the tiles came off, and they're not critical for re-entry or landing. However, they were put on there for a purpose, and they came off, so there will be a, an investigation and an improvement, a modification in that area, and... The next time, I'm sure they'll stay on, knowing how NASA and Rockwell work and Lockheed, who makes the tiles, we'll make I'm sure we'll make right. it work. <laughs> right, but the critical area for the tiles is in this area here and on the bottom half of the bottom part of the aircraft. That's where the most heat and the most intense heat comes. Now, the question has arisen, well, why are the tiles black? Why is it black on the bottom of the spacecraft and white on the top of the spacecraft? Now, the answer given is that when the spacecraft is flying in, in this position, that is, with its top toward the sun and in orbit, that you want to reflect the heat. And that when the spacecraft is coming back into the Earth's atmosphere and into this critical period in which so much heat is coming up uh, underneath, that you want the spacecraft, in so far as possible, to radiate heat. And while we know that white reflects heat, black radiates heat somewhat better, and that that's part of the reason that it's black underneath the spacecraft. Any other reason, Leo Krupp? Well, I think that's basically it, Dan. You have anything to add, Al? No, the, the different colors absorb and radiate differently. For example, they painted the top black so it would absorb better from the sun. But if you want to radiate these temperatures, you need something black. Mm -hmm. And the, realize these temperatures, like you pointed out, are 2,600 degrees, 2,300, 2,000. We're talking about a lot hotter than what the top would get or the sun gets it. 
So they wanted it to reflect the sun's heat on the top of the spacecraft and radiate heat from yeah, below. Can't see. Yes. I believe we again had some communication from uh, Mission Control, so let's see if we can pick that up. That's a chase plane uh, in the air. That's one of the aircraft. Uh, Mission Control at the moment is not talking. I remind you again that the uh, astronauts are out of communication. They're in their communications blackout uh, at this moment. And we are roughly uh, 50 minutes to touchdown. Chase, this is Houston. You can anticipate getting a Mach 9 call. Over. There's one copy, Houston. Houston out. Now, so it's clear in your mind, and uh, to make sure there's no mistake, that the communications blackout period has just ended. The most critical phase has ended. However, we are not in voice contact with the astronauts at the moment and won't be for a while. So far as can be determined, everything has gone well with the re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. We can't know for certain and for sure uh, until we are back in voice contact with the astronauts, but things certainly look good at the moment. Uh, the end of the blackout period, the communications blackout period, which we pointed out before, while a, a somewhat dangerous, I suppose strike the word somewhat, a dangerous period and certainly a tension-filled period, but an expectable one, and in some ways reassuring because it does mean that the uh, astronauts are on their way back to Earth, but the blackout period ended at uh, 10.08 a.m. Pacific uh, Standard Time. Now, that will be uh, actually coming up uh, momentarily. Now, Leo, is it clear in your mind whether we are or not out of the blackout period? We're not yet? out yet. We're out of the blackout as far as the heat and entry, but we're not in communications. Now, we're going to be picking up tracking here in just a minute. Okay, so tracking you can control. in just a moment. Let's try to pick it up. Chase, disregard the Mach 9 call. We'll give it again shortly. We'll go, we'll go. Showing an altitude of 160. 2C band radar contact showing an altitude of 165,000 feet. Range to go 410 nautical miles. Stand by for mark on 9,700 feet per second. Hello, there. Houston, uh, Columbia's here. Oh, the Hello, voice of the Columbia, astronauts. Houston's here. How do you read? Glenn Square, and we're doing uh, Mach 10.3 at 180 AS. And we couldn't agree more, John. Your state vector's good. We've got uh, good data in-house. Okay, it looks to me like the L over D is normal. Thank God. Well, the translation of all that is the guys with the right stuff are in the right spot. They're <laughs> exactly where they were Succinctly supposed second. to be. That is it. Perfect energy, perfect ground track. Oh, boy. Oh. <laughs> now, we may have the first sighting now, of nine uh, times the, the uh, shuttle in flight. Let's right. take a look. John, we're showing you rolling perfect. right. Looking good. Right, I'm all roll. He's still off the coast, man. Rolling now. This, uh, we believe, to be the... Uh, this would be a shot from the chase television chase time. plane. Okay. It's very difficult for us to see now it out here, but this is as the uh, space shuttle Columbia approaches the coast of California. What terrific news to hear the, the voice of those astronauts. Now, this shot is from the uh, peak, we, Anderson Peak, uh, near, uh, and this is a long lens camera to say the least, and we believe we're picking up the uh, space shuttle in flight back in the Earth's atmosphere. Roger that, Crip. We're looking. And let's take a listen as Mission Control talks uh, to the astronauts. What a tremendously exciting moment to hear the All voice of the APU astronauts again. All in there, looking good. Roger that. We can go. We have a live television picture from the optical yeah, tracker at Anderson P. Crossing the coastline we'll now. We'll show you crossing the coast now. Roger that. We can go. 141,000 feet. About 11 Range miles down from Big Square. Tack hands, go ahead and take them. Okay, going in. About 11 miles south of uh, Big, Big Sur, Sur, California. Crew now incorporating tactical air navigation system data into the spacecraft. Mach 7. Approximately 11 minutes to touchdown. 135,000 feet, range 221 miles. Columbia. Dead on the ground track. Very quiet to us. Well, let's go out in here, too. What a way to come to California. What a way to come to California, indeed. <laughs> that is so good. That's the crew has started to lower Columbia's nose. Columbia, you're out of 130K now on the tracking. 6.4 miles, looking good. Roger that. Don't we agree with those numbers?
The spaceship has ceased to be a spaceship. It's flying like an airplane now. Roger that. Mach 6, 124,000 feet. Six Range times the speed of sound. Miles. And John, we're seeing near zero aileron trim. Uh, we're seeing two tests. Yeah, less than that now. Roger that, out of 119K, 5.5 knots. Jack Riley in Houston talking to uh, Commander John Young. Roger, we copy. Should be coming down Interstate 5 just about now at Button Willow. <laughs> the space shuttle now flying like an airplane, or perhaps better said, flying like a glider right down Interstate 5. Roger that, out of 112K, 4.8 miles. Range 130. John Young rolling, using manual control now. We see Dell at 21 degrees. Roger that, looking good. Mach 4.4, 107,000 feet. Range 112. Approximately eight minutes to touchdown. Roll reversal complete. Control looks good. Columbia, we see roll reversal complete. Control looks good. Rope's coming out. And you're starting to get an oil cooling now. Roger, we can try. And Columbia, you're out of 100K with positive C. Looking good. Ejection seats can be used oh, now. Beautiful. Below 100,000. Spacecraft, since it's below 100,000 feet, they can now use their ejection seats if necessary. Looks pretty good from here. Roger that. Looking good. We're looking at them. And you're coming right down the chute. But everything is looking Rather good. Active now. Looking good. Everything right on. Range 73 miles. Columbia, we're go for air data. You're out of 89K, 2.8 miles. Should be passing just south of Bakersfield right about now. Heading for Edward. Roger that, we're looking. Reversal to the right. Columbia, we see you coming right, looking good. Okay, two point five. Have a hard time seeing the talkbacks on those landing gear. Hydraulic isolation valves. They look okay, Jim. Roger that. Looking good. Every head, all eyes at Edwards Air Force Base now okay, turn upward, looking to see the spaceship as it comes into view. Now, for those of you at home, remember you may hear the sonic boom. We now have a live television picture from the long-range optics at Dryden Columbia, Light Research Center. Columbia, you're coming right around the track. The uh, tracking data, nav data, and pre-plan trajectory are all one line on our plot boards here. All right, we can try. As the space shuttle comes over the Edwards Air Force Base California landing site, you may hear a sonic boom. Mach 1.8, range 42 miles. Be right up in there. Spacecraft will make one pass over the dry desert lake bed, then swing around and Columbia, has one chance at a landing. High in altitude, coming down nicely, and the fess uh, is to go to off. Mach 1.3 at uh, 58,000 feet. Range 33 miles. That is the Space Shuttle Columbia you see on your screen. Looking good. Jack Riley in Mission Control, Houston, talking to the astronauts. He'll be in constant contact now, and we'll let you hear as much of it uh, as there is.
Roughly five minutes to landing. Mach 1 at 51,000 feet. Range 28 miles. Columbia, you're going subsonic now out of 50K. Looking good. Roger. After 54 hours. Columbia, you're approaching the hack now. Sonic right boom. on the money. You hear the boom? That was the sonic boom as the space shuttle nears its landing site. Columbia getting ready to start the big sweeping turn into the runway. The truth has a tally. Roger, take it. Crip, uh, altimeter 3009. Roger that. That voice, Joe Allen, who is the Capcom communicator with the astronauts feet. themselves. Jack Range Riley is the voice miles. of the shuttle. Columbia, you're coming right around the hack, looking beautiful. They made one pass over. Space count aboard, 30,000. That was a sonic boom you heard when you know it. Control very smooth. Yes, they've already made a pass over. They've gone over, now they're in the tower. The space shuttle has gone over the landing site, has made its turn. Columbia, you're really looking good. Right on the money. Right on the money. Now, in its final approach, they get one chance to do this. Critical time will be with it. Does the landing gear come down? That's manual control by Commander John And Young. we're seeing 1.3 Gs coming around the hack. Roger that. And turning on the final, your winds on the surface are calm. I got a wind. 25,000 feet. Point six, range 13 miles, 22,000 feet. Air speed approximately 325 miles an hour. Control looking very smooth, speed break, break at 40. We have a television picture now. You're right on the glide slope, Columbia. They're lining up at the runway now. Right on glide slope. Approaching center line, looking great. This TV from the chase plane. Sixteen thousand feet. Mark fifteen. Airspeed two hundred and seventy one knots. The chase plane is just below the shuttle. Fido says it couldn't be any better. Eleven thousand feet. That's real good up in here. Next critical moment, at about two hundred feet up, they'll put the gear down. Nine thousand. Two hundred and eighty knots. Everything looks real good. That's the chase plane that looks like a parasite fish just behind the shuttle. And the crowd begins to rumble at the edge of Air Edwards Air Force Base as the shuttle comes into view. There it is. They're coming. They're down. They're down. The landing gear is down.
Welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. We're going to dust it off first. on the Columbia. And Gentlemen, there's plenty of time to talk. There's plenty to talk about. But let's take a deep breath and just suck up, soak up this moment. This is Mission Control Houston. The unofficial touchdown time, two days, six hours, 20 minutes, 52 seconds. Two days, six hours, 20 minutes, 52 seconds. And Columbia Houston, we're estimating at least 26 more minutes on the ammonia. You're looking real good. Fire trucks, three helicopter rescue teams, and paramedics on emergency standby. Touch the lake bed. The flight director's instructions were prepare for exhilaration. <laughs> there goes the convoy. Convoy command vehicle going out now. There'll be 12 vehicles with 270 ground crew members moving into position on the edge of the lake. The safety man in a protective suit with air supply goes out to check for leaking explosives or toxic gases. If any leaking explosives or toxic Convoy gases should be found, toward, uh, then a trailer-mounted 14-foot fan would sweep the shuttle with 45-mile-per-hour wind to disperse any gas. It's going to be quite a long while now before the astronauts come out of the space shuttle. What a moment. What? You know, this kind of excellence, absolutely zero flaw. Incredible. It seems incredible to see the vehicle show up after being gone two days out in outer space. It just shows up on the end of the runway and rolls out. It is incredible. As John Young said, what a way to come to California. <laughs> now, two trucks are going to hook up hoses to the rear of the craft to air condition the interior and pump the inert gas through the engine and fuel lines to clear any lingering vapors. If any high concentration of explosive hydrogen fuel should be found, then the astronauts and the ground crew convoy would leave the area on an emergency basis, but there's no indication that that's going to be necessary. If all goes well, and there's no reason to believe it won't now that the Space Shuttle Columbia is on the ground, the astronauts safe and well at Edwards Air Force Base, the hatch will be opened and a doctor will go aboard to check the crew uh, who will exit uh, about 37, 38 minutes from now. This is a high shot as the Space Shuttle Columbia is on the dry lake bed desert floor. And the support crew, if we can get a shot of those strange uh, anteater looking vehicles going out, there they are. They are the uh, two trucks with the hook hoses designed to clear the craft, uh, to air condition the interior, and pump any inert gases through the engine and fuel lines to clear out lingering vapors. Uh, weird, strange, bizarre looking machines. Going out to the machine, the tremendous air machine that has just opened a, a new era of the space age. Our CBS News coverage of the landing of the spaceship Columbia will continue in a moment. But the wings are no longer in space. The spaceship Columbia is on the ground at Edwards Air Force Base, and what you see is the crew, the members of the ground crew, sniffing for gases around the spacecraft. The astronauts are still in the cockpit, uh, celebrating in their own way inside there. It'll be maybe 34, 35 minutes before they're out. Uh, those giant uh, machines that look like praying mattresses uh, with the long hoses uh, going over the aircraft, standing by ready to pump out any uh, uh, gas that might be found. These are all in the way of uh, safety checks for the spaceship Columbia. 
These men, uh, the ground crew members with emergency suits on in case any trouble develops there. They are, of course, prepared to get the crew out of the spaceship uh, if any trouble develops. This is going to take uh, on the order of a half hour. What has just happened here at Edwards Air Force Base is something that has never been done before. A rocket ship was turned into a spaceship for 36 orbits around the Earth. 54 and a half hours later, it became an airplane and uh, came to Earth from 176 statute miles up at a speed of 17,000 miles per hour at 25 times the sound of speed, uh, the speed of sound. I'm so excited that my tongue is running ahead of my brain. And this is the way it looked as the Space Shuttle Columbia, John Young, from that great height and those, those great speeds, put it right literally on a dime on this dried lake bed landing strip. This is a replay on videotape. Small chase plane behind. Uh, we understand. Wait, Bob Crippen said, what a way to come to California. That's affirmative, the big uh, ship bearing the American flag and USA on its wings. And you want a GPC this was just you after it made that long left turn. Way one, please, John. This is a replay of the landing of Spaceship Columbia. Critical moment when the landing gear came down. Touchdown, said communicator Joe Allen. And went on to say, welcome home, Columbia. Beautiful, beautiful. And what a job Commander John Young and Bob Crippen did. They brought this huge spaceship, rocket ship turned spaceship, then turned airplane glider, right down to the exact X on the landing strip where it was designed to come down. Simply could not have been any better. CBS News coverage of the voyage of Spaceship Columbia will continue after this pause for station identification. Our CBS News special report, Wings in Space, continues with Dan Rather. Spaceship Columbia on the ground at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The spaceship and her two pilots have gone through their final and most dangerous test with a blazing hypersonic descent through the atmosphere. Brought the uh, airliner type vehicle right down on the prearranged exact spot where it was designed to land. These are pictures uh, live from Edwards Air Force Base where 12 vehicles and 270 ground crew members are in position, uh, some of them in their uh, emergency suits, the ground crew members, working over to make sure that there are no dangerous gases anywhere uh, in the spaceship, in fuel lines, or anywhere else. Uh, Veteran Flight Commander Young said it was super. As he got on the ground today, a cheer went up, of course, inside Mission Control in Houston when the 122-foot-long ship rolled to a stop. Bob Crippen, the pilot, joked, do I have to take it in the hangar, Joe? We'll have to dust it off first, Alan replied. <laughs> uh, so much dust, of course, on, on this desert floor. Uh, that kind of humor, uh, uh, of course, indicating uh, how relieved everyone is here. I got the feeling that the crew was uh, probably the loosest of anybody connected with this whole thing. Certainly, uh, John Young could not have brought it down as perfectly, and we use that word measuredly, perfectly as he did if he hadn't been fairly loose in that cockpit. Takes a lot to shake John up. He's one of the best stick and rudder men around. <laughs> yeah. The crew still has several procedures to complete inside the cockpit as the ground crew swarms on the outside of uh, the spaceship Columbia. But inside that cockpit, the procedures that are now going on can be demonstrated and will be by Mort Dean and Jack Lausma, the astronaut uh, in Houston. Jack and, and Mort. Dan, that spaceship that had so much trouble, so much difficulty passing go, has finally flown in space and has come to a stop. And it says that in the actual flight plan, STOP, preceded by braking, light, moderate, as required. Go immediately to post-landing and then stop. 
So they would probably just uh, pull the flight plan off of the Velcro pad here. I don't know whether I could do it, but I'm sure they could. And stow it away, and then Jack Lausma, what next? They come up with the post-flight plan. Well, see how easy it is, Mort? You just follow the recipe and uh, make it look simple. It sure and did. And after they uh, came to a stop, they established communications with the convoy and uh, immediately took off their helmet and gloves to uh, get comfortable. They installed the... Uh, safing pins in their uh, ejection seats in order to ensure that uh, they didn't fire off inadvertently. Uh, then they're closing off the valves in their uh, reaction control system and their uh, Ohm's propellant system to safe them. They're uh, also then uh, turning off uh, all the power to the uh, various black boxes and uh, electronics units that are no longer required. And of course, one of the things they want to do first is uh, shut down the auxiliary power units, which provide the hydraulic power for control systems and uh, getting the gear down and so forth. They're powering down so that only two of the computers are working and mm -hmm. a number of those kinds of things to uh, clean up the spacecraft, to uh, get it ready for the uh, people to open the hatch and to come on in and check them out. They are still working. It's not over. That's correct. They have uh, a lot of things that have to be done. They'll be in there from 30 to 45 minutes and the uh, one of the first, of course, who will be in there is uh, the uh, flight surgeon who will check them over to uh, make sure they're both okay and then uh, They'll exit the spacecraft, and uh, two of our other astronauts, uh, Gordon Fullerton and uh, Bo Bobko, will go in there to be in the space shuttle for uh, its roll in into the hangar, where it'll be uh, uh, attended to some more. Okay, and it says down here, MCC to LRD handover. Mission control to, what does LRD mean, Jack? LRD. <laughs> <laughs> We're not sure. Okay, there's one thing I caught you on, then, LRD. Uh, thank you very much, Jack, and Dad, I... We've all seen some of the uh, test landings of a shuttle out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base, and this was as good as any of those drop tests. It was just absolutely beautiful. Thank you, Borden Jack, and we'll be back with you a little later on. And our CBS News coverage of the return of Space Shuttle Columbia will continue in a moment. A thing of beauty and a moment of joy here at uh, Edwards Air Force Base as the Space Shuttle Columbia out there on the desert floor uh, being swarmed on by ground crew, crew members and uh, inside the spacecraft itself. Uh, Al Bean, that they have just uh, shut down their ammonia boiler, you told me. The cooling down process has started. It's still scheduled to be, what, about 20 minutes before they get out of there, but they might get out a little ahead of, ahead of schedule. Uh, they started a uh, short while ago a giant fan to blow uh, any gases that might be around the spaceship away. Unfortunately, they uh, pointed that fan in the direction of the anchor booths over here. I don't think they were trying to tell us anything. <laughs> I don't think there's any danger, but if it's all the same to them, I wouldn't mind if they just turned those fans in the other direction. <laughs> the Space Shuttle Columbia is successfully back to Earth and the crew is safe. This is Dan Rather reporting from Edwards Air Force Base in California. Now, as our CBS News coverage continues of the successful return of the Space Shuttle Columbia, and as the crew is safe inside the Space Shuttle uh, to come out of there uh, somewhere in, roughly in the area of 19 to 20 minutes from now, and uh, as some of the uh, rescue helicopters return uh, from their missions and uh, prepare to uh, come back down and uh, take part in the celebration here at Edwards Air Force Base, let's try to talk uh, Leo Krupp and Alvin. Leo Krupp, a veteran test pilot with Rockwell International, Al Bean, uh, a veteran astronaut and still with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Let's talk about uh, what this means and where this will take us. I'm reminded that Chris Kraft, the director of the Johnson Space Center in Houston and a man who has done so much for the American space program, has just said that with the success of this mission, quote, we just became infinitely smarter. Now, Leo Krupp, what is this going to mean for us? We've talked about it bringing us into a whole new era of the space age, but in simple terms, what's the advantage? Well, Dan, the first thing, with this successful flight today, it means we'll get our second flight off probably by the end of August of this year, and uh, we should be able to step through this flight program fairly rapidly, and uh, it looks like the shuttle is, is really going to be a going machine, and it won't be too long before we'll be able to become operational, at which time it means we'll be flying a launch, hopefully, when we get full op fully operational, will be about one launch a week. It's going to be very commonplace. Then we can really start to reap the benefits of this program. We can start putting up satellites, bringing satellites back, 
doing useful work and, and really progressing what we really should be doing, and that is taking advantage of our capability in space to make this a better world for everyone to live in. The important thing, among the important things, is that this is a reusable spaceship, that it can go into space, return, go into space, and return many times over. Now, Albine, uh, if you, yes, just very quickly, I was handed a note, uh, and we'll bring in uh, our colleagues in Houston in just a moment, but Albine, you said uh, at one moment, uh, off camera and off microphone before, that the Russians will be eating their hearts out. Uh, I'm not sure I want them to eat their hearts out about this. I mean, certainly it's a patriotic moment, and certainly we, if there is a space race, if there is a race, you always want to finish first. But it has uh, some long-range implications that I think all of us uh, uh, regret. But what did you mean when you said the Russians now be eating their heart out? Well, I meant simply that uh, we've entered a new age of space with this reusable capability, with the total payloads we can carry around. Uh, with our ability to do this job, uh, I think the events of the last couple days have deceived many people into believing this is all easy. This is incredibly complex, and the fact that we could execute it indicates the kind of capability the U.S. has. At the moment, the Russians haven't demonstrated that capability. There's no reason to believe that they're going to. So it's more of what can this country do, and this country can do a heck of a lot, and we just saw it, and we saw it made look easy. And so if the Soviets have in mind getting some military advantage in outer space, uh, this, in your view, sends them a strong, clear signal that they'd better check their whole cards. It sure does. It says, uh, we don't plan to catch up with you. We just leapfrogged you. And uh, we're standing out in front of you, and um, here we are. And we're going to try to use this for peaceful uh, efforts. But at the same time, uh, you can see what America can do, and this is a lot. And uh, people in the space business there will understand just how much that is, how good this event is, and what it shows about American technology and ability. Well, speaking of American technology and ability, a lot of people took a lot of reps over this first space shuttle flight. The people who made those tiles, and I'm not just talking about uh, the man in charge of manufacturing, I'm talking about the guy who has to manufacture those things. Put Everybody up and down the line. Uh, the people who uh, made the computers, the people who developed the software, anybody who had anything to do with even so much as a rivet of this space shuttle must have heard all those jibes about, well, this thing is a space lemon, this thing is a hanger queen, this thing is snake bitten. You heard a little of that, didn't you, Leo Krupp? I certainly have, and, and I want to tell you, Dan, that I believe that John Young is going to write fewer squawks on this 54 and a half hour mission than most test pilots will write on the first two hour flight in a new airplane. <laughs> I, want to, I want to bring in Mort Dean and Jack Lausmer, the uh, astronaut uh, in Houston. Mort and Dean, you've covered the uh, space program uh, since the early 1960s, and I'm wondering what thoughts you have about the meaning of what we've seen today and what it tells us about the future. Dan, there's no question that it is a giant leap forward. We've seen a little bit of history made today. It wasn't too many years ago that uh, more than a few people didn't think this kind of flight was possible. And as you say, there have been a lot of doubters. It is of immense importance to the Pentagon. You gentlemen have covered that thoroughly. But I think while it has proved an awful lot, as far as uh, the civilian possibilities for the space shuttle, I think it still has uh, some time to go before uh, it's proven whether or not this will be the low-cost spaceship of the future that NASA had hoped. Uh, it'll take a while to determine just how many of these shuttles will be developed and how many will be able to fly and just what kind of civilian satellites they'll be covering or carrying up into space. So I think a lot yet remains to be done before we can say that this is exactly the spaceship of the future and it's exactly what the civilian side of the space people uh, wanted. And I want to bring Jack Lausma in now and just change the subject a bit. Dan, people have been training many hundreds of hours for the future flights, and my colleague here, my co-pilot Jack Lausma, is one of them. Jack, when would you expect shuttle, you thought I was going to ask, when do you expect to fly, but I won't. I know that's always a touchy question here at NASA, but I know it's soon. I, I caught the glint in your eye. But I, my question was, when, when do you expect the next shuttle to fly? We of course, to, it'll be uh, this shuttle. When will this shuttle fly again? We hope to fly uh, two more flights this year, Mort. Of course, uh, we have a four-flight test plan that uh, was originally uh, designed, and, uh, and the second flight is supposed to be flown in August, and the third flight in December, and the uh, fourth flight uh, in the early part of next year. And they will be uh, successively, successively more uh, involved flights. They will have more equipment on them. They will be pressing the uh, limits a little further, and we're going to test this flight 
the space shuttle before he really put it into operational use. And this uh, very uh, spaceship, the Columbia, will be brought back to Florida and will be uh, outfitted again with uh, a new external tank and they'll check those tiles over and uh, the Columbia is the second ship to fly as well as the first. Jack, I wanted to uh, thank you very much. I'm, we're going to see more of you during the day, but you've been a big help. I uh, know uh, it always make, makes uh, the uh, correspondent appear as the expert uh, at occasions like this, but you've been of immense value, and I just wanted to thank you publicly. You're welcome, uh, Morton. It's been a pleasure to work with you and CBS also. Uh, now that you're all trained and ready to go, we'll put you on the list, and uh, perhaps you'll be flying a shot not too distant future. Well, I'm not going to offer you an invitation to come into my business, though, Jack, because I think you're too good. Ned. Thank you very much, uh, Jack and Mort. And, uh, Jack, if you don't mind, I'll take you up on an invitation. Uh, put me on the list. I'd love to go. I don't know that I could do it, but I'd love to. Uh, the crew is still in the cockpit of the triumphantly returned Space uh, Shuttle Columbia. Uh, they are expected to come out about 11.05 this morning, uh, West Coast time. That would be 2.05 Eastern time, 1.05 Central time, and CBS News will stay on the air for that. Our CBS News coverage of the return of the Space Shuttle Columbia will continue in a moment. Dan Rather at Edwards Air Force Base in California with uh, Al Bean of NASA, former astronaut, Leo Krupp of Rockwell International, and at Mission Control in Houston, uh, Morton Dean and Jack Lausma. The astronauts have been advised, by the way, to hold on to their hats when they open that hatch. Uh, they still have a few minutes before they do that, but they've been told to hold on to their hats when they open the hatch because of the blast from that uh, very large wind machine, what some people call a humongous wind machine, is out there <coughs> blowing just in case there are any dangerous gases still around, that the uh, leader, the convoy director, of the crew that is going over the spaceship so carefully and trying to make sure there's nothing dangerous, no gases, trying to pump the gases away, has said that in his first inspection, the initial inspection, showed nothing wrong, uh, that everything looked fine, the astronauts are safe and sound uh, inside the successfully returned space shuttle. <coughs> Al Bean, uh, Bob Crippen, the, uh, the younger of the two astronauts, 43-year-old Tuxen, uh, the one with the smashing smile, for those of you who don't always uh, know the difference between the two astronauts. John Young is the older and perhaps uh, a little more introspective and uh, pensive, although he has an excellent sense of humor. But Crippen said, the L over D is better than advertised, especially during approach and landing. Now, could you translate that for us? Yes, uh, L over D, lift over drag. It tells you how far a, an airplane can glide. Something like the shuttle might have an L over D of four. It means it's got to come down uh, four miles or it come to, every time it comes down a mile, it can go forward four miles. An airliner, it comes down a mile, it can go forward 15 miles. So what it indicates to him is, or uh, to the crew is, that we've got a machine that glides better than we thought. Let's just say it glides like an improved brick or a streamlined brick. <laughs> is so it it's a little better than we thought. When, when he says the L over D is better than advertised, especially during approach and landing, uh, is it fair to say that what he was talking about, it flew even better than it was expected? Exactly. To Let's take another look uh, at the moments before landing and the landing of the space shuttle itself. This is after 36 orbits uh, around the Earth, uh, 54 and a half hours. The uh, Columbia had one pass with a sonic boom over the Edwards Air Force Base in California, then a left turn and a sweep by with one chance to make a landing and what a perfect landing it was. John Young in control of this gliding aircraft now. Say in control, computers can land this, this space shuttle. Uh, John Young wanted to take the controls and the plan all along was for him to take the controls. Uh, among other things, he lowered the, man the landing gear manually, got the uh, attitude of the aircraft just right for the landing. Is this something that could have been done in toto by computers, Leo Krupp? Uh, everything can be done by computers when we get the auto land system uh, qualified, except the lowering of the landing gear and the braking after touchdown will always be a manual uh, chore for the crew to do. And we'll see the touchdown here in just a few seconds. The 
letter perfect a double plus landing we've said it before but we'll say it again that landing on the exact spot where it was planned from 176 statute miles out in space at speed sometimes 18,000 miles an hour now landing speed was just over uh, 300 miles an hour the convoy team members are now getting washed down to remove any toxic chemicals from their protective suits. That's the ground crew members. Uh, John Young is now looking out of the hatch window. He hasn't opened that hatch yet, but he's looking out of the hatch window. And our CBS News coverage of the return of the Space Shuttle Columbia will continue after these messages. Out on the heat of the desert floor, the desert landing strip for the Space Shuttle Columbia here at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Commander John Young, uh, one of the two heroes of the moment, along with pilot Bob Crippen. John Young last reported looking out the window of the hatch, so they may come out of there a little earlier than it was expected. Uh, we'll keep our eye on it. Uh, this, of course, a forward view of the Space Shuttle uh, looking uh, through the windows uh, out of which the uh, astronauts had those tremendous views in space. And just before the, uh, well, actually, at the moment of re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, just before that, Bob Crippen said, uh, boy, when somebody said space is black, they really meant it was black. Uh, the hatch is not yet open in the space sh uh, shuttle. Uh, once the hatch gets open, after medical checks, the crew will be reunited with their families, and uh, they'll have a, gr uh, a brief greeting to the crowds here. Uh, very brief. Uh, no news conference is planned here. I'll tell you more about that later. For the moment, uh, let's look very carefully now because we certainly want to see the what the space people call the egress of the crew uh, from the space shuttle, which means uh, the getting out of the crew. From the, the hatch is located uh, precisely where, Albine? Uh, it's located right under the cockpit window there. See, see that see circled area? That's it. For those of you watching at home, look at the cockpit, the windshield area, we'll call it that, of the cockpit. Now in the middle, slightly lower left-hand part of your screen, there is a circled area on the side of the spaceship Columbia. As a matter of fact, if we can come to the model here on our set and show you the relationship, that circled area is where the crew will, uh, that's the hatch. There's a little window there. See, here's our model. This is the circled area we're talking about right here. Now let's go back to live on the runway and all of our viewers will be uh, oriented. I think we can go back to the live shot on the runway of that hatch area there. You see the circle? Now, there's a little window down there, and John Young has been peeking out that window, a little like a uh, kid in the candy store, peeking around, getting himself uh, all set to come out of that hatch. Uh, it'll be a few more minutes if the schedule holds before they come out of there. Yes, because I noticed that uh, from that view that they haven't moved the stairs up to the hatch yet. So that right, would be man. the telltale sign that yes, they were actually they coming up. Yes, when they start moving that up, then... Uh, so after medical checks, once they're out of the hatch, they'll have the medical checks. They'll be reunited with their families uh, who are here uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. There'll be a quick greeting to the crowds here. Then the astronauts will fly directly back home to Houston, arriving at Ellington Air Force Base at approximately 6.30 Houston time. That's Central Standard, uh, 6.30 Eastern time tonight, arriving at about 5.30 Houston time, Central time this evening at Ellington Air Force Base in Houston. They'll be arriving 5.30 Houston time, 6.30 Eastern time tonight. And then on Wednesday, they'll begin seven days of debriefings about the flight. For more on the crew's uh, schedule, once they get back to Houston, here is more team. Dan, you would think after training for three years and flying in space for 54 and a half hours and making such a beautiful landing, the astronauts would be rewarded with a day in the country at least, uh, perhaps spending a, a weekend out at a, a ranch out in California. But as you say, they are coming back to mission control coming back to the Johnson Space Center and Jack Lausma no day off for John Young and Bob Crippen tomorrow well Mort a uh, different way of looking at it is that they just had their uh, three-day long weekend they had their day off in space and now it's back to work and uh, they'll be back uh, tomorrow debriefing and they probably have a checklist that they have to uh, go through to debrief and uh, put all the information on tape and then they'll be uh, in lots of meetings with engineers and uh, we always look forward of course to the uh, crew debriefing uh, with the other astronauts to get the special pilot types of reports that we all like to hear about we want also to uh, update our simulators to uh, determine uh, what we can do to improve their fidelity to uh, retune them to make them fly just the way we found out it was instead of the way we thought it was we uh, will also uh, ask them to help improve our procedures and our techniques what we must add what we must take out 
Then I also uh, heard them get an invitation yesterday from the uh, vice president to come to Washington, so that's uh, in the offing, no doubt, and they are surely do some rest and relaxation one of these days because they have been doing nothing but thinking and doing on this mission for a long, long time. And when you and Al Bean took that 59-day trip aboard the Skylab, how long before you actually had a day off here on Earth? Al and I uh, had the good privilege of cycling back as uh, backup crew members for the uh, flight with the Soviets, the Apollo-Soyuz mission in 1975. So we arrived back on the ground uh, in uh, late September and uh, November we were in Moscow. Without a day off. Okay, thank you, Jack. And now we'll go back to Dan and Al and Leo. Dan? Thank you very much, Morton. Uh, Bob Crippen from uh, inside the spaceship. The spaceship Columbia successfully returned uh, to Edwards Air Force Base here in California. The astronauts are still inside. Bob Crippen, uh, the junior member of the crew, 43-year-old pilot of the aircraft, is up still in the cockpit area looking out the windows. John Young, the senior member of the crew, and the commander is down there at that very tiny, almost porthole window, actually smaller than a porthole window, uh, by the hatch itself. That's the circled area in the forward part, uh, midsection of the forward part of the aircraft. John Young looking out there. Uh, they're not uh, at the moment about to come out because they've not yet put up the ladder to that uh, hatch area. And as Al Bean, uh, my astronaut friend who's here helping uh, along with Leo Krupp uh, with commentary from Edwards Air Force Base pointed out that uh, of the a lead member of the ground crew will go up the ladder first and go into the hatch and then uh, John Young and Bob Crippen will come out. But Bob Crippen uh, said from inside the spaceship, mighty pretty day out here in California. And then uh, Crippen went on to say, if we're going to have all this time, we can set up the TV and have a post-flight news conference if you want. <laughs> <laughs> They're eager to get out and get in the real world. Well, there's a correspondence astronaut, I'll say that. You see, I like the way he thinks. Uh, however, that is not the plan. There's no news conference planned for today. It will be uh, uh, some little while before a news conference is planned, at least uh, two or three days. I think that the tentative schedule, uh, double check me on this if you will, Mark, the tentative schedule is to hold a news conference in about three days five days. It'll be five days according to the schedule before a news conference is held. And of course everyone can understand that with the kind of pressure the astronauts have been under and the main business is to debrief them on their flight, uh, get them uh, reacquainted with their families and give them uh, hours and days of uh, joy and relaxation. And then there'll be plenty of time to talk about uh, the amazing success, the tremendous accomplishment of the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia. The, the first, first manned spacecraft ever launched, uh, the first winged spacecraft, and the first spaceship to carry a human crew on its maiden voyage, first reusable spacecraft, and the first manned spacecraft launched with solid rocket boosters. Albin, you were going to say something? I was going to say, uh, the first thing they want to do when they get back, uh, after they see their families uh, and get a little bit settled, is immediately start uh, uh, dictating the information so that uh, they won't forget it. And uh, this takes quite a little time because you want to record every word they say, every way they say it, because uh, that's when you remember the most. Then they can go over that transcript several days in a row, uh, modify it with what they remember, and then they'll be ready to talk to the press because they want to, what we call data dump. They want to dump all the data they've got from this flight before they forget it. And you and I both know it's easy to forget even with a day or two passing to me that someone might ask, well, if there's glass uh, on that hatch and, and in the cockpit, how did that glass stand up to all that tremendous pressure and heat uh, that we talked about earlier? Well, the side hatch window, for example, is 11 inches in diameter. It consists of three separate panes of glass, totaling about one and one quarter inches thick, and it's a special kind of glass which can very well hold up uh, to the kind of pressures exerted on the spacecraft. For those of you who may have joined us late, these photographs, these pictures are live from the desert floor and Edwards Air Force Base in California, where the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, after Sunday's uh, perfect launch, 54 and a half hours of uh, near-perfect space flight, 36 orbits around the Earth, made an absolutely letter-perfect landing. Uh, John Young, the commander at the controls, and the ground crew is making sure that the spacecraft is free of uh, any gases, uh, dangerous gases, pumping air conditioning inside the spacecraft, and we're waiting for the crew to come out. Down in the VIP viewing area here at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, Terry Drinkwater is with Apollo 8 astronaut Bill Anders. Terry? Thank you, Dan. Uh, you went around the moon uh, a few years back, and, and now this, and you've had uh, a half an hour to reflect on it. Uh, what are your thoughts? 
Well, Terry, I'm uh, just really thrilled to be here at this uh, very historic moment in uh, manned space flight. Uh, historic in the sense that it is the culmination of a tremendous development program that NASA's undergone in the last 10 years or so that really really is amazing and they read a, read a real pat on the back. And historic also in that, to me, it represents the real beginning of usable everyday space. This uh, truck or space shuttle is really going to open up space like the DC-3 opened up aviation. Nowadays, you wear the Air Force General's uh, Reserve General's uniform. What does it mean militarily now? Well, the, uh, the shuttle is a truck. It's a, it's a transport, and it can uh, carry uh, all kinds of, uh, of satellites, uh, those that are of use to the military, those that are used to the civilian world. And uh, the Air Force uh, that I'm involved in as a reservist is uh, keenly interested in the shuttle, backs it 100%, and I think are going to get particularly excited about it now that they've actually seen it perform its, its mission today. Thank you very much, former astronaut Anders, who, along with uh, the rest of us here, are gathering around the area where the astronauts, the astronauts from the shuttle will, some hours from now, perhaps one hour, or an hour and a half from now, will appear and, and speak here briefly for the first time before they fly back to Houston. But all of that, of course, after their medical checks inside the spacecraft and then their medical checks uh, as they progress to the, the trailer where they will be more detailed examinations of them before they proceed down here. So from the VIP area, Dan, to you. Thank you very much, Terry Drinkwater. Uh, the spacecraft uh, is uh, still undergoing the safety checks that are absolutely necessary. And you were telling me, Al Bean, and let's listen in for just a moment so we can pick up Joe Allen, the Capcom communicator, talking to the crew still inside the spaceship. Roger. That sounds like Rick House, really. Maybe Rick House now. These are members of the ground crew checking out the ship. Well, Capcom for the moment has gone uh, silent, but Albin, you were saying earlier that uh, Bob Crippen and John Young, you thought they were ready to come out of there and have been for some minutes, and it's the ground crew that's holding them back. It kind of looks that way, but it's interesting, John said, uh, that Zero G could get around in that uh, cabin like a seal or an otter, but uh, that 1G with that heavy suit, he was having a little difficulty to get up the ladder, so. Uh, Dan, the white room is coming out now. All right, yes, the white room now coming out uh, here on the desert floor. Now, this white room, uh, the purpose of this white room is what, Leo Krupp? Well, that's for the crew so they have a way to get down out of the spacecraft, and they will come into that compartment up on top of the ladders, and they'll open the hatch, move that in, and the crew will step into the white room. And that way they keep Very dust good. and uh, the light from getting of the desert here from getting inside the orbiter. You know, we like to keep that very clean, keep all the electronics nice and tight. Exactly. So this, uh, again, very strange-looking equipment being used on this aircraft. Uh, first, we had those praying mantis-looking uh, uh, hose-carrying machines. Now we have uh, this uh, rolling uh, portable white room, uh, which will go up, match up with the hatch area of the spacecraft. The astronauts will step into this, and they can close off the spacecraft and make sure uh, that the dust and sand and humidity does not get into the spacecraft itself. From President Reagan in Washington, this message sent to the uh, astronauts still aboard the triumphantly returned uh, Space Shuttle Columbia, quote, congratulations on a job well done. I am very proud, unquote, uh, President Ronald Reagan, who is recovering uh, there on the, uh, in the upper stories of the mansion part of the White House in Washington, D.C. Uh, the president, we're told, uh, followed both the uh, liftoff and the progress of the orbits around the Earth and today's return uh, very carefully. Both astronauts said to be all right all right upon hearing that the white room was being uh, moved in. And that's what's uh, happening out there at the moment. The uh, cockpit uh, section of the orbiter, that forward part of it, the living and working quarters uh, for the astronauts themselves, uh, at the upper area of the cockpit itself and in the lower area uh, where they worked and uh, did uh, some of their experiments, although there were very few of those, just uh, medical among other things. Uh, but the payload area, that's the payoff area of this, what is designed to be a kind of truck, a freighter for outer space. Mind you that if all goes well, if this orbiter is in good shape, it's to be fired up into space again in September. Right, Leo? End of August is the target launch date. End of August, the target launch date. The Space Shuttle Columbia is scheduled to go up again, end of August, maybe in September, to go up again and return again, and it'll have, what, uh, over 40 flights into space if all goes well. Uh, that's right, and when we do the second flight, it's going to be a four-day mission, and we're also going to have an active uh, re uh, maneuvering arm or uh, manipulator arm in the 
cargo bay. The cargo bay behind what you're seeing now. This is the forward part of the spaceship. The white room is there, being hooked up to the hatch. Let's watch now as the ground crew prepares to let the astronauts out and seal the spaceship off. And we'll be getting our first sight of the astronauts since early Sunday morning when under tension as thick as storm clouds, they uh, were hatched in, locked in to their spaceship. Apparently they uh, have to reposition that uh, white room because they pulled it back and they're moving in again, Dan. Right. I think maybe they missed, the, missed lining up as perfectly as they need to be. You'll want to note that some of the ground crew are no longer wearing their protective suits, so there must be no toxic fumes or dangerous fumes around the aircraft because the ground crew, uh, they've jettisoned their own uh, protective suits, and that's uh, more good news. The danger has not been large here, but there has been some danger, and that's the reason that the astronauts have to stay in that uh, spaceship as long as they have. You've got a, a sight of the spaceship in the area just behind where those where that ladder, where those stairs are being put up against the hatch, and that area behind is the payload bay, which is large enough to hold, for example, five African elephants. Nobody has proposed sending African elephants <laughs> into space, but that gives you some idea of the size of that payload area. That is to say, the part of the space truck that can carry things into space. You may be saying, well, what kind of things would they carry into space? Satellites, uh, telescopes. In 1983, is it, or 84, when the telescope is supposed to be put into space uh, by the space shuttle? A tremendous telescope which will enlarge man's knowledge of the cosmos uh, by 50 times over. Uh, that's an example of what we mean when we say that there's a whole new era in the space age introduced today with the successful return of this reusable spaceship. Better shot of the, the length and breadth of the spaceship. Columbia's nose wheel. After Looks like the uh, crew is beginning be, uh, to, uh, ground crew is beginning to work on the hatch the now. Way to an area at the Dryden Flight Research Center. The orbiter is 122 feet long. It's 57 feet high. Its wingspan 78 feet. And the orbiter weighs 165,000 pounds. And to give you some idea of what it took in the way of technology and uh, expertise to get this ship into space and back, it weighed four and a half million pounds at takeoff. All except 165,000 pounds of that was basically fuel and the weight of the solid rocket boosters and the huge external tank. Those of you who weren't with us uh, at liftoff on Sunday morning, you remember that the space shuttle, when it was on pad 39A in Florida, was a muscular trident, three parts. The solid rocket boosters, the external tank, and then the orbiter itself riding piggyback on the external tank. Solid rocket boosters did their job to get it up. Uh, then they were jettisoned aside. Then the orbiter using its own three powerful main engines set in its tail. Uh, breathing fire almost, it looked like a tiny sun going up into space. But using the fuel from that external tank. Then when uh, the engines, the major engines had done their job, the external tank was jettisoned, uh, came to, uh, apart and uh, over the Indian Ocean. The solid rocket boosters, the two Roman candle looking pieces of equipment off to the side were parachuted down to the Atlantic Ocean. They've been retrieved and will be reused. The external tank will not be reused. Of course, the orbiter itself, the heart of the space shuttle system, what you're looking at now on this uh, dry lake bed and landing site at Edwards Air Force Base in California, will be going up again and again and again. And uh, other orbiters uh, already uh, in the process of being prepared. Uh, this is a continuing process. We now have a system for reusable spaceships to carry loads into space, such as that telescope I described earlier. The so-called uh, mobile white room is up against the hatch now, having been realigned. It required some real realignment a moment ago. And we expect to see the astronauts uh, John Young and Bob Crippen emerge uh, in a short while. You know, Dan, even though we only brought back 165,000 pounds of spaceship, we brought back most of the expensive parts. We got the three main engines, we got the computers, we got uh, the what we consider to be the most expensive parts of uh, the total system. So we did jettison things off, but uh, we hope to reduce the cost by bringing back the really uh, the ones that really cost so much to replace each time. We've talked about the people and the technology it took 
You can see the heat from the desert floor, and this shot of the front of the space shuttle gives you some idea of how much heat is coming up off that floor. By the way, that uh, dry lake bed is as hard as concrete. If you hit on it, you could easily uh, break your foot by tapping too hard on it. We expect to see the uh, astronauts emerge in just a moment. And this is Houston transmitting again. The helicopter on the right side pick of up, the orbiter, uh, we'd prefer that it be moved let's pick to up a greater distance shuttle. or to secure operations. Uh, they were asking for one of the helicopters to get away just a little bit. They don't want to stir up any dust. Had uh, helicopters, protective uh, helicopters overhead in case they were needed for any emergency. It now asked them to clear away, and the helicopter is, uh, having done its job, flying away. It takes so many people with so much dedication to make to pull something like this off. I said before, we talked about the people who built this system and developed this system. Uh, you hear a lot these days about dedication and professionalism being out of style. Then you see two people like John Young and Bob Crippen, whom we are about to see emerge uh, from this spacecraft. And it tells you that uh, it may have gone out of style, but uh, then again, maybe dedication and professionalism hasn't. It sure hasn't during this flight. Uh, both the crew members and all the ground uh, personnel have demonstrated the uh, incredible capability that this country has to do the job right. President Reagan recently uh, talking in private to some people was quoted as uh, saying something very similar to what President Kennedy had said when he dedicated uh, the United States of America to uh, being first on the moon. And that was, he said, that something like this requires the total commitment to excellence of hundreds of thousands of Americans. And that's what you see represented on that desert floor right now. It's a total commitment to excellence by thousands of people who put this system and this space together. The ladder now. Dr. Fisher should be aboard uh, that van. Now the van is, uh, you can see the van just to the right of your screen now, pulling up near the spaceship. Dr. Fisher will be going aboard uh, very shortly, I think. What's the purpose of having the physician go aboard rather uh, than just see them when they come out? Well, you've got, uh, you've been up, even though they've been on gr zero gravity for just a short time, I think they want to assure themselves that uh, their physical condition is uh, satisfactory for, uh, you know, for, for walking around. This is a, a change in their system of two days. We know the human body degrades pretty rapidly when it doesn't have to, to support itself. And um, I think they just want to make sure everything's okay with uh, Crip and John, they don't want them to trip. They don't want them to have an unusual incident here just because they're a little bit weak. Coming back from space, you have a, a feeling a little bit like you've uh, been laying down for a long, long time or maybe been in a sick bed. So you want to make sure you're OK. Yes, Dr. Greg Fisher. Right, we're eagerly you anticipating your uh, departure. Well, uh, we're still here, you know. And Let's pick uh, up a little bit of the crew's if conversation. We're going to get this thing operational. This is one of the parts we're going to have to work on a little more. John's complaining about the time it's taken to get out. He's restless. <laughs> John, I'm pushing as hard as I can. <laughs> who was that? What are you pushing? John Young. John Young. <laughs> no, but who was it talking back to him? A uh, Capcom. Uh, uh, probably the convoy Cal. commander. Now, commander John Young, uh, and I like it. He says, I've done my job. Get on the stick, boys, and do yours. Uh, I'm tired of staying in this hot thing. Remember, he's still in that very heavy suit. He is. We could have gone the whole orbit. They're doing pretty good, though. They're doing pretty good. John Young said, well, we could have made another orbit uh, in the time it takes you to do this. That's probably going to be the major squawk of this flight is that it takes too long to egress the vehicle. But uh, I suspect uh, that with astronauts and test pilots, as with correspondents, patience is not always a long suit, particularly when they're once on their ground. Dr. Craig Fisher is indeed standing by to go uh, inside the uh, spacecraft at any moment. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it occurs to me to say it, but it does occur to me to say it. When you, you think you about this that you have your, uh, stuff awesome accomplishment your bags, uh, your of bike. John Young and Bob Crippen, uh, uh, let's remember the ground crew you see there. The yes, crew so. is not yet ready to come out. When you think about them, you think how proud all of those school teachers they had along the way from kindergarten <laughs> right up through uh, university and right up through places like the Tuxet Naval Air well, Station must be that, uh, of having uh, folks there had a little that. part 
in educating two people who can achieve this kind of excellence. As a matter of fact, Leo Krupp, you were one of those teachers. You had John Young uh, under you at the Toxic Naval Air Station, did you, John? That's right. John was a student there when I was back there on the staff, and so was our friend Alan Bean here. <laughs> yeah, he took good care of all of us. <laughs> Dr. Fisher, I don't believe, has come out of that van. The van is pulled up to the ladder. Both of these uh, men inside the spacecraft being Navy men, uh, and this being a spaceship, we'll call that a ladder, or stairway if you want. I don't believe he's yet gone up the stairway and gone into the spaceship where he'll uh, check the astronauts over very quickly, but mostly bring them out, and the door will close to seal off this, the orbiter, and then we'll see, have our first uh, uh, view of the astronauts uh, since they have returned to Earth. Mort Dean in Houston and Jack Lausma in Houston, uh, the Jack Lausma, the astronaut, who I know is just chomping to get up in one of these space shuttles himself, we'd like very much to bring you into this conversation while we uh, anxiously await, eagerly await, the emergence uh, from the uh, spacecraft of the two heroes of the moment. Dan, as you mentioned, the two astronauts will be back in Houston later on today, and the spaceship itself will uh, be uh, checked over in California for 10 days to two weeks, and then it will be mounted again on top of a 747 jumbo jet and take a two-day piggyback ride back to Florida, where there's a lot of work to be done, isn't there, Jack, checking over the shuttle once it's in Florida? Yes, there is, more. Of course, they'll uh, want to take it and uh, look over the tiles very closely and uh, refurbish those that need it. Uh, they have uh, more equipment to install in the uh, spacecraft. Uh, they'll want to do lots and lots of tests just to see how everything held up and whether or not it's performed as uh, anticipated. Uh, there will be some uh, parts replaced. And the uh, people at Cape Kennedy, uh, who always do such a great job, uh, will uh, again do another one, but they want to go over it with a fine-tooth comb to make sure it's ready for the second flight. Uh, later this summer, early fall. Pardon me one moment, uh, Mort and Jack. The hatch is open. Hey, John and Crib. The hatch show. is open. The astronauts, uh, John Young and Bob Crippen, as military protocol, uh, John Young, senior, and the commander will come out first, or will he come out second? I don't know. We're going to have to see. Uh, I mean, I would think the Navy man, you would know. Oh. The, uh, the other guys off. We copy. The ground crew uh, making their uh, last checks there, making sure that everything is uh, married up as it should be with the white room and the hatch. We, unless I'm mistaken, we still have to see uh, Dr. Fisher go into the spacecraft. I don't believe he has yet gone into the spacecraft, but the hatch is open. And an impatient John Young, I don't think he'd mind my saying that at all because he's made it pretty clear, an impatient John Young uh, inside the spacecraft uh, is only a, a, a few minutes away, perhaps only a few seconds away from uh, getting out of the spacecraft. Uh, Bob Crippen, we haven't heard much from him the last few minutes. What would he be doing now, Al? Is there anything to do in there for no, him? No, I think they finished all their work. They're standing by. You might wonder why it takes so long. It's because all these rocket engines and all the fuel that goes with them, the things that work well in the vacuum of space, for some reason, uh, many of them are toxic when you get them down here in the atmosphere. So the hydrazine, the hydrogen, uh, etc., cetera, uh, are things that uh, you and I or no human being would want to breathe, breathe just because uh, uh, it'd bother our lungs a lot. Houston, but uh, in, in uh, space, they're Jack the here, best uh, things that, uh, that work for rocket landing. engines that uh, work in space. So it's kind of a combination. You have the orbiter purge transporter to the right uh, rear of the orbiter, orbiter out of sight now. You have the orbiter ground cooling transporter to the left rear of the orbiter. The astronaut transport van, you can see that. That was the van no, no, off to the right of your in, screen uh, now. The convoy command vehicle, the orbiter tow vehicle, the crew hatch access vehicle. That's just to name a few of the vehicles and machines gathered around these successfully returned spaceship Columbia here at Convoy Edwards Air Force Base. Reports. The hatch is open. The hatch is open. Seals are being purged and uh, be a little while before they're given go for the exchange crew and uh, the doctor to go aboard. All right, so as we hear from... The exchange uh, crew is not composed shuttle. of astronaut tower. That this crew mans uh, Columbia while it is being towed. The doctor is not yet aboard the spaceship, and so it's going to be uh, a few more minutes uh, before they come out. Uh, everyone here at Edwards Air Force Base just uh, eagerly awaiting uh, this, this, the moment when we can see that crew come out uh, for the first time. Like uh, Morton Dean and Jack Lausma, uh, hold on just one second. They may be coming out 
I don't want to miss this. Uh, they're coming out of the spaceship, but we keep being well, told that uh, this is it. He looks uh, alert. He looks uh, sprightly. I think he's happy to be there. That's a hot suit with no cooling running through it. I think he wants to get in that van and get some cooling. John Young, and did he kiss the ground there? I think he did, didn't he? I think he did. <laughs> That's part of his sense of humor. <laughs> He's funny anytime you know him. <laughs> Shaking hands with members of the ground crew. Commander Young on the ground to be followed by pilot Bob Crippen, who will be coming out in just a few moments. And let there be no doubt, folks, you are looking at some kind of pilot. You really are. You're looking at the premier test pilots in the whole world right there. Uh, there's a lot of people in the world that uh, can fly, but I don't think anybody has ever demonstrated any more capability uh, and skill than uh, John Young and Bob Crippen uh, the last several days. It has been incredible. And Young is walking along, checking out the exterior of the spacecraft. <laughs> he wants to count those tiles. <laughs> He may be wondering if he can get aboard on the next flight. He may not be wanting to take it away. Did you see that uh, gesture of exhilaration with both hands and arms out to the side? Oh, I hope we have that. We can replay it. Happy? You bet. He's worked long and hard on this. Well, some things do not change. As they said about World War I aircraft, any landing you can walk away from is a good one. <laughs> Well, I think John's out there doing a uh, post-flight uh, uh, post yeah. check-out. Okay, hey, uh, Rick, you, have you guys got data back? Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bo here. I'm wanting to know the status of it. We John Young, data. 50 years old, from San Francisco. Veteran Navy pilot. 8,000 hours, can that be right? 8,000 yes. hours 8, of conventional aircraft flight. Now has been up and been back five times into space. A few deep knee bends to get himself a little loose, and who could blame him? Yes, sir. <laughs> Our most experienced astronaut, OTC exchange. the veteran of the American space program. And on the left is George Ebby, uh, his boss, uh, head of the uh, flight operations uh, division. Bob, Bob Crippen, excuse me, Al. Bob Crippen's still on board, and he's getting ready to hand the uh, uh, rest of the power down over to uh, Bo Bobko, it sounded like, another astronaut. And so he can get out and join uh, John Young on the ground. Where the world God's very restless. He's happy to be here. With the Mission Control Center patch. Going back up the uh, ladder toward the White Room. He's going up for another flight. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think he wants to go. Where did he go? Where did the other guy go? The future is now. Does it? I'll taxi it in. My director, Don Putty, has just informed his team that we have now handed over to uh, yeah, the uh, team at Dryden and the display control team can go back into exhilaration mode. This is Mission Control, Houston. <laughs> that looks like Gordon Fullerton, one of the pilots uh, on the ocean landing test for North uh, down at the bottom against George Abbey. Yeah, this is John Young. John He's been Young. back up. To, if Bob Crippen is still in the spacecraft. Yes. Don't mis be misled. These uh, gentlemen in the blue uh, <laughs> uniforms uh, are not part of the crew. You'll, you'll know Crippen by the uh, yellow spacesuit. And I expect you'll also know him by that ear-to-ear uh, -ear grin as wide as Texas when he comes out of there. Okay, we have a different uh, crew member now on the comm, so we ought to be seeing Bob Crippen soon. John Young has spent 25 years in the United States Navy, a great deal of it as a test pilot been on the moon, Apollo 16, in 1972. That was the fifth U.S. moonwalk. His wife, Susie, children, Sandy and John, both of them grown, are here. And here is uh, Bob Crippen. 
43-year-old Navy captain. His wife, Virginia, and uh, children, Ellen, Susan, and Linda, are also here. Handshakes all around for the ground crew as the space shuttle astronauts are put into the van. It'll be a short ride now before they can be uh, reunited with their families. It's planned to have a wave to the crowd here at Edwards Air Force Base and uh, just an acknowledgement of the crowd here. No news conference and the plan is that we won't be seeing a, a great deal of them before they go on to Houston. They'll be arriving in Houston about 5.30 Houston time, 6.30 Eastern time this evening. Be debriefed, spend some time with their families and hold a news conference in about five days. Earlier this morning, before the sun came up, the temperature was in the uh, mid-40s here on the dry lake bed floor that is Edwards Air Force Base. Now the temperature is uh, reaching about 90, everybody perspiring, and I would certainly thank the uh, astronauts in those uh, heavy suits and having been inside the spacecraft for as long as they were. You can see that heat and sand rise from the desert floor. This looks, uh, this airstrip looks like nothing so much as perhaps a set for a Lawrence of Arabia, the movie. And that scene from what's called uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Devil's Anvil. Hard, hot, very inhospitable to anything except spacecraft. It's a wonderful place to bring airplanes. <laughs> this was also the uh, set for a lot of uh, grade B uh, movies, old westerns. John Wayne operated out of here for a long while. Just about every grade B western in the 1930s, I'm told by my friend David Browning of CBS News, uh, was made out in this area. The television series Wagon Train, Gunsmoke. And as that van carrying the uh, two first space shuttle astronauts makes, it, makes its way away from the successfully landed Columbia, it's a long way from Wagon Train and Gunsmoke. No, but those kind of individuals can relate to John and Cripp. Uh, they played, uh, they uh, pioneers of the West. They uh, brings back what John said. He says, this is a great way to come to California. All, all them came east to west, and these pioneers came west to east. But they all ended up in California. Well, I know in the space business that uh, space is sometimes recurred, uh, referred to as the high frontier. And what you have now are two new frontiersmen from the high frontier. This live coverage from Edwards Air Force Base in California, the astronauts inside that van, the spaceship Columbia did everything asked for. 36 orbits, the full mission, 54 and a half hours, picture perfect, letter perfect launch, everything went uh, virtually flawless in outer space. Dangerous re-entry period, all that blackout time for communications. It burned through the outer stages of the Earth's atmosphere, back with one chance and one chance only to land it at the proper place, put it right on the X mark on the runway. Dan, this flight has been, been so perfect, it's almost unbelievable. When I think of the problems we have trying to simulate this flight, I'm convinced that the simulator is much harder to get up and fly and make a good uh, entry and a, and a landing than the spacecraft was. And probably that's the way it should be, because if it's tougher in the simulator, it makes it that much easier in the spacecraft, doesn't it? You had that wonderful scene just a moment ago, as you could see the heat coming off the desert floor, and I do not exaggerate when I say that you could fry an egg on, that, on portions of that concrete hard desert floor, and the van carrying the astronauts pulling away from the spaceship Columbia. In a moment, we'll try to uh, show you what's called the mate to mate area. That you may be saying to yourself, well, now what happens to this orbiter, which we hope will be going back into space? The Columbia, the first uh, space shuttle, be going back into space in late August or September. Well, the first thing that's going to happen to it is it'll go back on top of a 747 to transport back to uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Rhythmic applause begins for the astronauts as they near the crowd. Perhaps you can hear it. Over the helicopter noise.
As the van uh, nears the crowd, the crowd breaks its uh, long line of ranks and starts moving uh, out toward the van. Of course, there's plenty of security here, and the, uh, the van will go to a prearranged area. The first thing is uh, you have the astronauts quickly go through medical checks and be reu reunited with their families, and then there'll be a little greeting for the crowd. At least that is the plan. The van moving in the direction of the Hugh Dryden Research Center, that's the name of the NASA Research Center here. Edwards Air Force Base, named after test pilot Edwards. Famed test pilot of the 1940s. Hugh Dryden, uh, as we mentioned earlier, an early leader of NASA. This is a high shot of the band as it is pulled past the crowds now. And up to the special area where the quick medical checks and uh, Reunion with families will occur. The astronauts still dressed in their uh, ejection suits, not the lighter clothing that they wore when they were actually in orbit. Those were the orange suits that you may have seen as they came out of the spacecraft Columbia. official crowd estimate on how many people were here at it at Air Force Base. This is a, a vast Air Force Base stretching for many miles across this desert. And there are people in campers, pickup trucks, automobiles, uh, mopeds all over it. We heard one uh, offhand guest by a security officer this morning of uh, perhaps as many as 150,000. We simply have no way of knowing. The van has gone uh, completely off of the uh, airstrip area and into the hangar and building section of Edwards Air Force Base. And how good a picture we're going to get now of the astronauts coming out of the van and uh, into that long warehouse looking building where their families are waiting for them, we simply don't know. 50 year old John Young, the only American to fly five times in space. 43-year-old Robert Crippen, his first space flight. He was in the support crew for previous missions. Crippen waited 12 years plus. If you want to pick it from the very beginning, he waited 15 years to get his time in space. I bet he'd say right now it was worth the wait. <laughs> worth any wait. Young and Crippen both uh, in the Navy. as many of the uh, test pilots and later astronauts uh, have been, partly because of the demands of the uh, Navy flight training. And that's not to leave an inference because none is justified that it's any more demanding than the flight training uh, for the Air Force you know, or Marine Corps. We have Corps. just as many uh, uh, Air Force pilots, and we have you know, Marine pilots the same. And while the emphasis has been on test pilots in the early stages of uh, space travel, that with the space shuttle may no longer be the case, as now with the space shuttle you get a lot of people up into space, be more scientists going up. No American woman has ever gone into uh, space. There have been uh, Soviet women in space. Uh, soon there'll be some American women in space. Of the 82 astronauts, I believe now, there are two uh, blacks in training, and uh, hopefully nearing uh, three blacks in training, nearing the time when uh, uh, they'll be uh, making space voyages as part of the one of the space shuttle crews, hopefully. And as we await uh, our next sight of the astronauts who are now in the process of being reunited with their families, we'll pause to say that CBS News coverage of the triumphant return of Spaceship Columbia will continue in a moment. Our CBS News special report, Wings in Space, continues. Here again is Dan Rather. And as the sun burns down on the dry lake bed desert floor of Edwards Air Force Base in California, the spaceship Columbia uh, is uh, being prepared uh, for a flight back to the Kennedy Space Center uh, in Florida, piggyback fashion uh, on top of the uh, military version of the 747. 
the two astronauts who did such a remarkable job, who reached a new peak of excellence in the job they did in getting the spaceship Columbia safely back, and not only safely back, but right on the mark, the runway, they literally right on the mark where they were supposed to bring it. The two astronauts are uh, just, uh, oh, a couple of hundred yards, a couple of football fields away here now, being uh, reunited with their families, uh, undergoing some uh, medical checks. That's what the schedule called for. We haven't seen them in just a few moments, uh, actually a couple of minutes since they entered the van, and the van took them from the space shuttle uh, over to the area where they were to undergo the uh, medical checks and the reuniting with their families. We do expect to see them again uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the crowd, very few of the crowd have left here as yet, hoping for another sight of the two heroes of the moment. Hero, perhaps an overworked word, but in this case, a justifiable word. John Young and Bob Crippen, the uh, two astronauts, the uh, senior and junior members of the crew, who have just completed uh, a spectacularly successful mission for the first space shuttle, the first uh, machine built uh, to get off like a rocket, orbit like a spaceship, and return like an airplane. And a successful return it was. Let's have another look uh, through the miracle of videotape at the successful, perfect return of the Space Shuttle Columbia. This is the landing replay. John Young at the controls. There is a small stick in there. Most of the Space Shuttle's uh, work has been controlled by computers, but here in the final stages of the landing, John Young in control. Small uh, chase plane, perhaps you saw, beside the Space Shuttle. At this point, the Space Shuttle going uh, above 300 miles an hour, and I want to uh, make sure that uh, I didn't mislead uh, our viewers and listeners earlier. At, actually, at the time of landing, it landed at a speed of something over 200 miles an hour. Now, that's considerably faster than a normal airliner would land. I, I guess and say perhaps about uh, 100 miles an hour faster than your average airliner. The space shuttle roughly the size of a DC-9 airliner. This is videotape replay of the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia with the chase plane just beside it. Landing gear down. Critical moment to see if the landing gear would hold up. Make sure no tires are blown. That looked like a sink rate of about less than two feet per second, just absolutely perfect. Touchdown on the desert floor. When you say sink rate, what do you mean, Leo Krupp? Well, that's the rate he's, he's coming down toward the ground, and uh, it'd be a very smooth landing. You'd hardly ever feel it. Keep in mind, this is a 65,000, a 165,000-pound orbiter. A lot of weight and no power here. That was uh, a glide down by John Young. That was the uh, replay of the videotape of the uh, moment that we'd all awaited since the successful launch, the spectacularly successful launch on Sunday morning. Uh, all the more uh, exhilarating that launch on Sunday morning because of the disappointment of Friday morning. You will recall that the original schedule called for the spacecraft Columbia to be launched on Friday morning. Uh, the launch procedure got down at one time to within uh, nine minutes before launch when it was put on a hold. The uh, now famous or infamous computer problem developed in which uh, the computers uh, simply weren't talking to one another as they were supposed to do, and the launch uh, eventually had to be postponed until Sunday. There was deep disappointment about it, and once again, uh, all the talk started that, uh, well, maybe the space shuttle isn't going to work, uh, maybe it's a lemon, maybe it uh, is just snake bitten. All of that talk uh, began, but then on Sunday morning, the uh, launch rescheduled for 7 o'clock Sunday morning, picture-perfect launch, 54 and a half hours later, 36 orbits later, the Space Shuttle Columbia made it down here at Edwards Air Force Base uh, completely successfully. We want to see if we can get a brief glance uh, uh, at the astronauts. Uh, they're back over a couple of hundred yards. Let's see if we can have that glimpse of them. We're not sure that we can get a glimpse now. I don't think so. But now that we've had, we did have a brief glimpse uh, a moment ago. This, uh, well, that was an attempt to get in the area of the van. But uh, we certainly don't want, no one wants to intrude on the privacy of the moment of the astronauts' reunion with their families. We simply wanted to make sure that we didn't miss any public uh, appearance back there. But we have had uh, some brief glimpses of the astronauts uh, as they came out of the aircraft. 
And now we've had that, uh, I'm sure that uh, Morton Dean, uh, my CBS News colleague and astronaut Jack Lausman in Houston, has some thoughts on these latest American space men. Mort? We uh, were uh, just looking at some paperwork here, Dan. Earlier you mentioned to uh, Jack Lausma that you might want to be signed up for a future flight as an astronaut. And uh, I, I suppose they'll be taking someone from CBS News some, at some time in the future. So I took out my astronaut application form that is going in tonight, Dan. And uh, here at least, maybe we could ask just a couple of questions. Uh, Dan? Yes, Morton. I uh, wish to be considered for, uh, this is question number one. I wish to be considered for mission specialist candidate position, pilot candidate position, uh, both mission specialist and pilot candidate positions. Now, you, you can mark one of those. Which would it be? Well, Morton, you know me. Uh, frequently in error, but never in doubt. I'll go for it. Check all of them, if you will. Check all. Our grade point <laughs> average on a 4.0 scale. They want to know how you did in college. Uh, your graduate record examination, and uh, if you're interested in a pilot's job with NASA, combat experience as a pilot, and if you're interested in a mission specialist astronaut candidate's position, flight experience as a crew member, and uh, we can just move over here. Uh, it used to be that you had to be a pilot, Jack, and uh, here we've got the mission specialist astronaut candidate program, and... Uh, bachelor's degree from an accredited institution in engineering, biological or physical science or mathematics, ability to pass NASA class two space flight physical, which rather difficult, I imagine, uh, distant visual acuity, uh, 20 uh, over 100 or better uncorrected, correctable to 2020. So you could uh, wear glasses and become an astronaut, become a mission specialist, and you don't need to know how to fly. And my final question, Dan, is blood pressure, uh, preponderance systolic not to exceed 140, you know, I don't think we ought to go on with this, but uh, we're getting ours in tonight, and uh, you can count on Jack to get yours in. The astronaut corps has expanded from just seven at the beginning to over 80 now, Jack. 84 now. 84. All different types of people, not just pilots. A broad spectrum, and um, I'm not sure you fellows want to join us. You know, you'd uh, have to quit working for a living if you joined us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, nice thing about our job is this, uh, it's mostly indoor work. Today is an exception, mostly indoor work and no heavy lifting. Uh, that's not true with the astronauts, I know. And it's not seasonal. <laughs> it certainly is not seasonal. Uh, the astronauts is pretty seasonal. I asked Bob Crippen. It took him uh, 12 to 15 years to, to have this day. John Young and Bob Crippen are still um, uh, being uh, checked over medically and uh, either in the process or any moment will be uh, in the process of being reunited with their families. Uh, we're waiting to catch uh, yet another glimpse of them here at Edwards Air Force yes. Base. I hope that we can. The important news, of course, is the uh, spacecraft uh, Columbia performed uh, beautifully, flawlessly, through the uh, difficult, uh, tricky, and even dangerous period of uh, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, John Young, the commander and veteran uh, test pilot and astronaut, brought it back uh, uh, perfectly to where he was supposed to at Edwards Air Force Base under uh, marvelous weather conditions. It is simply one of those days when, in terms of this mission, uh, it is difficult to imagine how it could have gone any better. And yes, there are serious people with serious questions about the whole space program uh, and about the space uh, shuttle program. Not all of those questions have been answered, but the big question, will it work, has been answered. By the way, the Columbia, the orbiter itself, will make the roughly three-mile trip back to the hangar area at less than one mile per hour. Now, that's about 17,500 times slower than what it was doing just a few hours ago out there in space. We want to, if we can show it to you, the so-called mate-to-mate area. I mentioned to you that once the orbiter has been fully checked over out there on the desert floor, uh, they'll bring it at a speed of less than one mile an hour back to this section. Now, this yet another strange-looking piece of equipment here at Edwards Air Force Base is what they call uh, the mate-to-mate uh, area, and this is the mate-to-mate device. What happens here, when the orbiter is brought back to this area, it's put up on this device, this is what allows the orbiter to go piggyback on that NASA version of the 747. You may recall, there's the uh, NASA version of the 747. It's designed to do this job. Now back, if you will, to the structure itself. Now, on the structure, the orbiter goes up on the structure. Once they get it up on there, then they can load it, now back to the 747, if you will, load it right on the back of the 747. You recall seeing pictures of the orbiter uh, being transported from California 
to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It was a rather humiliating trip, as a matter of fact. They had <laughs> rough weather. It took them about three and a half days the first time they made the trip. And then they had, unfortunately, uh, for Leo Krupp and others at Rockwell International and all who'd been involved at NASA in preparing the Columbia, they, the tiles fell off. On we, the lost, way over there. we lost more tiles on the trip to Florida than we did going into space, Dan. <laughs> Incredible point. And, and we've <laughs> mentioned nice this before, but there was so it. much concern about the tiles. The tile makers and the tiles themselves took uh, one terrific beating, both in print and on the air. Uh, everybody knocked them, but when they had to do it, they did it and did it well. When the chips are down, that's when it counts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this mate-to-mate -mate device puts the uh, orbiter on the back of the 747 uh, type aircraft, and then it'll be flown back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, from where it will take off again, uh, hopefully in late August, possibly in early September, but it'll be going back up again if the schedule holds uh, in a few months. That's what it's designed to do. And it'll be some time yet before you see the uh, orbiter, the spaceship, the first space shuttle, Columbia, retired and on display there at the Kennedy Space Center as Apollo and so many others of the spacecraft are on uh, display. Now, once it becomes operational, the shuttle will be used for a number of purposes. One, of course, is to put satellites into orbit. Another is to provide transportation for a European space laboratory. Steve Young now reports on this and other missions in the future. Space Lab will resume the work pioneered by America's first Earth orbiting space station, Skylab. We have roughly 40 experiments covering a number of disciplines, astronomy, uh, life sciences, material sciences, and uh, if you count all the variations of these experiments, you can get up to close to 80. Specialists who go up on early space lab missions will have to return with the laboratory after only seven working days in space, compared with Skylab missions that ran up to three months. So it's a frustration. It's, it's an it's, I like to compare it to the camper mode of doing things. We're sort of going out and staying in a camper rather than going off to a factory to work. The space agency expects that by 1985, shuttle will take the space telescope into orbit. It should be able to see seven times farther than telescopes on Earth. To the distance, light travels in 14 billion years, perhaps the very edge of the universe and the beginning of time. One of Shuttle's selling points was that Space Lab could help demonstrate manufacturing procedures impossible on Earth and make them cheap enough for industry to exploit. McDonnell Douglas Corporation and a division of Johnson & Johnson hope by 1987 to have an automated factory in space 500 times more efficient than Earth-bound versions, producing rare serums for the treatment of human disease at an enormous profit. For a reasonable size um, market in one of these particular products, you're probably talking better than, a, it could be better than 100 million annually in sales. Most corporations are more cautious about industry's future in space. You've got to figure out, you know, what is the risk, what is the front end investment, uh, what are the operating costs, uh, and that sort of thing. And uh, there just isn't enough information right now to answer those questions. Further down the road, NASA envisions far-out concepts made possible by a machine called a beam builder. A prototype exists right now. Carried up by the shuttle, the beam builder could manufacture girders needed for huge structures. Since space has no gravity, the beams wouldn't have to be strong enough to avoid collapsing under their own weight. A vast latticework of beams could support giant antennas making wrist radio communication with satellites possible. 50 square mile solar power stations could each send to Earth as much energy as 10 nuclear power plants. The space agency is convinced that shuttle will make it possible to achieve such visionary schemes, ideas which seemed like science fiction a few years ago. They are certainly things that could be, and I believe they're things that will be. The only question that I think that I have is who will do it in the not too distant future? there will be continuous habitation in space and useful things being done in space to the benefit of all of us here on, on Earth. If shuttle is successful, NASA believes it could change space from an exclusive club for astronauts to a place where thousands of people live and work. Steve Young, CBS News at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Thank you very much, Steve Young. Terry Drinkwater watched the successful landing of the Space Shuttle Columbia in the VIP area here at Edwards Air Force Base. Terry, what was the reaction like and what are your own feelings about it? Well, indeed, Dan, it was very clear here as we saw it across the desert. We saw that magnificent landing, how very much this craft meant to so 
many of the people who are still here. These are many of the nation's political leaders who fought for the shuttle program all along. Also in this group, many, many of the astronauts and, and former astronauts who were cheering for their comrades and, and for NASA on this very important day. And they're still here because it will be to this audience right here behind me an hour, perhaps more than that from now, that the astronauts will first appear and, and speak. We all know them from these past three days as very articulate and often humorous men from space. Now we'll get a chance to uh, see them in person. It will be brief. They will reflect only very briefly on the flight. They will receive honors from the representative of the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, his Secretary of the Air Force is here. And then, after this, they will fly off to Houston. Dan? Terry, thank you very, very much. What a morning it has been. A morning here on the West Coast, uh, afternoon on the East Coast uh, of the United States. A triumphant return for the Space Shuttle Columbia. For myself, uh, reminded of two things. One is that you often hear it say, said that the United States has to stand for something besides militarism and making a buck. Uh, voyaging in space can uh, make a stand for something more than that. Also, I'd like to thank my space uh, coverage colleagues for their assistance covering this mission, among them Al Bean and Leo Krupp here, and Jack Lausma and Morton Dean in Houston. Our coverage of the shuttle, including some brief remarks from the astronauts themselves, will continue on the CBS Evening News tonight, and we'll have a special wrap-up of the entire mission tonight at 11.30 Eastern Time. Until then, this is Dan Rather, CBS News at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Happy landings. This has been a CBS News special report, Wings in Space, the first flight of the shuttle. This portion was sponsored by the Bell System, putting its knowledge to work for your business in the information age. And by Polaroid, makers of new Time Zero cameras and the film they were named after. Columbia is a, a phenomenon. It is an incredibly amazing piece of machinery. And any time you can take something that big and put it into space and bring it back and land it on a runway, you have just accomplished something just short of a miracle, I believe. Well, let me tell you, it was well worth the effort. We've got one fantastic machine. And we have given the country one marvelous technological capability. For me personally, it was the darndest time I've ever had in my entire life. This is a CBS News special report. Space, the first flight of the shuttle. Here is Dan Rather. Hello again and good evening. At 20 minutes and 52 seconds past 1 o'clock this afternoon, Eastern Time, the United States of America re-entered the space race. That's the instant that the new space shuttle Columbia, perfectly guided by astronauts John Young and Bob Crippen, landed on the concrete hard desert lake bed here at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And that's the instant that Americans opened a whole new era of manned spaceflight. Young, Crippen, and the Columbia proved that humans and a machine can rocket into orbit, fly like a spaceship, return to Earth and land like an airliner, and then go back into space on the same craft. After more than two years of delays, for a time at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, it looked like the shuttle still might not make it. Friday's scheduled launch was scrubbed, computer trouble. Then, Sunday morning, she thundered into orbit with an earth-shaking jolt that could be heard 50 miles away. 
Bruce Hall recalls the awesome perfection of the launch. On Friday morning, Commander John Young and pilot Bob Crippen were up at 2 a.m. for a breakfast of steak, eggs, and orange juice before leaving to suit up for the initial flight of the shuttle, which takes off like a rocket, flies like a spacecraft, and lands like an airplane. After the two astronauts got inside, the countdown proceeded smoothly until 16 minutes before the scheduled liftoff. We're presently holding past the normal time in which we would pick up the countdown uh, because of a problem with the number three fuel cell. And moments later, there was a problem with the computers. The fuel cell problem was fixed, but the 6.50 a.m. launch time came and passed, and the shuttle remained on the pad. Everything they tried from the control rooms failed to make the computer warning lights go off. Finally, three hours and nine minutes after the scheduled liftoff, NASA gave up. The launch director, George Page, and center director, Dick Smith, have just announced that we will scrub the launch attempt for today. By the time the astronauts finally got out of the cockpit, they had been strapped into a horizontal position for nearly six hours. The next morning, it was back to the modified shuttle training jets for the astronauts for more practice. Bob Crippen returned to the landing strip first and was in a good mood as he sat on the hood of a car and joked with the ground crew as he waited for John Young to taxi in and get out of his plane. Meanwhile, the computer experts were not relaxing as they tried to figure out what caused the warning lights to come on. It was the primary system computer coming on 40 milliseconds ahead of the backup computer, and the solution was simple. Shut down the computers, restart them, and run a simple test to ensure they are in sync. With that, the decision was made to go ahead, and the countdown clock was restarted for a Sunday morning launch. It was not until the astronauts were en route to the launch pad the meteorologist said the weather would not interfere and as they crawled into the space shuttle, they were told that no problems remain. There were more than a half million people on hand for the early morning launch. Their eyes were glued to launch pad 39A as the clock ticked down to the scheduled 7 a.m. launch. This time, it did not stop. Five, four, we've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Shuttle has cleared the tower. The liftoff was perfect, and two minutes and 23 seconds into the flight, the recoverable solid rocket booster separated and fell into the ocean. Columbia. A short time later, the Space Shuttle Columbia was given the command, go for orbit. Bruce Hall, CBS News, at the Kennedy Space Center. Young, now a veteran of five space flights, called this one super. We'll be back in a minute with more highlights of the mission. Minute and 52 second flight of the Space Shuttle, Morton Dean has been at Mission Control in Houston. A scene of joyous celebration when the shuttle came down. This flight, this historic moment, was a moment made of many things. Guts, know-how, dreams, ambition, patriotism. And it was a moment made of music. A raucous wake-up song the other morning played from Mission Control. hanging off the side. Look out, boys, you're in for a ride. She's gonna switch into overdrive. Just lay back and let her slide. Don't hit any fence posts on the way up there, boys. Flip them switches. All right. Griffin and Young are in the driver's seat with tons of thrust sitting at their feet. Home sweet home never sounded so sweet. After this ride, they're gonna be beat. Shook their socks off. The men on board the spaceship Columbia lived in several different worlds out there. The serene world, quiet, beautiful, eerie. 
They lived in a world where each day was many days and nights. Each day they saw 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets. Joe, when whoever said that space was black, what can you? It is really black. And there was the other world, the world of worry and possible danger. We want to show you our home spot here. We do have a, uh, a few tiles missing off of, uh, of both of them, uh, off of the uh, starboard pod. Uh, it's got basically what looks, appears to be three uh, tile and some smaller pieces. And off the port pod, uh, looks like I see one the full square and uh, looks like a few little triangular shapes that are missing. A number of tiles were either missing or damaged tiles used to protect the spaceship and the men on board during the fiery return to the atmosphere below. It raised many questions about whether other tiles, unseen, may have fallen off, jeopardizing a successful end to the mission. NASA, though, was confident, always optimistic. And these tiles that, uh, that we have missing here uh, on the Ohms pods, uh, we firmly believe will be of no consequence to us whatsoever. These tiles miss missing will not uh, have any effect on the safety uh, during entry of the vehicle. And yesterday, in a call from Vice President Bush... I think your trip is just going to uh, ignite the excitement and the forward thinking from this country, so I really just wanted to call up and wish you the very best. And today, on that runway in California, and in a control room in Houston. And in millions of parts, there was proof. The optimist had won. Horton Dean, CBS News, Johnson Space Center, Houston. We'll return in a couple of minutes with more on Wings in Space. Close up of the perfect landing. You can't believe what a flying machine this is, Young exulted as the 90-ton Columbia rolled to a stop. Tens of thousands of voices roared relief, approval, and celebration. Among them, Terry Drinkwater. On the earth below, the crowds came before dawn, here to the land where the Paiute Indians used to roam. And in the skies above, the chase planes were up in force scouring the heavens above runway 23 for a glimpse of the traveler, Columbia. Hello, Houston, uh, Columbia's here. Hello, Columbia, Houston's here. How do you read? And suddenly, after the scorching heat of re-entry, there she was, a dot hurtling across the California coastline 25 miles high, hurtling home at 4,000 miles an hour. Dead on the ground, Very quiet to us. Well, let's quiet in here, too. What a way to come to California. Dropping, losing speed, suddenly gliding into view before perhaps a quarter of a million spectators on the ground. Right over it. Come on down, baby. And then, after two days, six hours, 20 minutes, and more than a million mile odyssey through space, Commander John Young eased down the landing gear for the tensest moment of them all. We're down. 50 feet, 40, 30, 20, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, touchdown. And then, after bringing Columbia home almost precisely on the spot marked out, it was time to wait, to wait while ground crews made sure no poisonous gases were venting from the craft. Like air travelers who jet across country and then wait endlessly for their luggage, the astronauts became impatient. Well, uh, we're still here, you know, and if, uh, if we're going to get this thing operational, this is one of the parts we're going to have to work on a little more. And finally, a victorious John Young emerging to look over his craft again and again kissing the ground at one point, and co-pilot, Robert Crippen. Both men fit and feisty after a trip into the history books. They were joined by their wives for a red carpet welcome, and they spoke jubilantly 
about the resumption of American manned space travel after six long years. I think we've got a fantastic and remarkable capability here. We're really not too far, the human race isn't, from going to the stars. As the rookie of the group, I can say that waiting 12 years to get my flight in space was well worth it. Now I'll go stand in line for another 12 years if that's what it'll take, but I don't think it will. I think we're back in the space business to stay, and I think myself and all of my compatriots are going to get many more opportunities to fly. Then men and machine went their separate ways, the astronauts flying back to Houston and the shuttle towed in for painstaking inspection, ultimately to be flown piggyback on the 747 back to Florida to be launched again in September. And so it was that the Columbia came home after a trailblazing trip through space, home to this lonely desert valley. Once before another trailblazer came this way, Kit Carson pioneering the West. He rode on horseback, passing almost this very spot. And that was just 147 years ago. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base, California. From California, Young and Crippen took another flight, this one more conventional, to Ellington Air Force Base in Houston, Texas. Their home base and a huge welcome home. Here's what that looked like. There, there aren't words to express. There aren't words to express just how uh, grateful we are to everybody that did so much to help this mission go successfully. But there are a few people that need special thanks. I think, for example, that my wife Susie put up with me for nine years <laughs> while I was working on this contraption and uh, the last three while we we're training for it, living, eating, breathing, and sleeping it deserves a thanks. And there's one person in particular that I'd like to thank. Um, it's uh, Captain Robert Bob Crippen. Now, Bob is a very smart young man, and he also works very hard, and he kept me out of a lot of trouble on that flight. <laughs> I <know> where it was. <laughs> when he wants to know the spacecraft, he knows it completely. And there were some uh, moments up there and in route and coming from up there where we had some very exciting places where we had to perform very complicated and complex tasks and Robert did all those things and uh, <laughs> he did them without uh, he did them with even ignoring uh, some potential personal risks and I think he did one hell of a job I'm going to recommend him to be a commander of one of the early space shuttle flights. <laughs> That's no joke. For me to get a chance to fly with a guy like John Young and for him to come out with words like that, well, <laughs> most of you have to know John to understand that. I was just hanging on, hoping he'd point me in the right direction. <laughs> and I think the American public is going to get their money's worth out of this baby. Because it will allow us to do in the 80s and 90s just exact things that we must do for our defense and to advance science and technology. The real cornerstones of what it's all about in this country. We got the capability right now, and so I say to everybody here, let's just press on and do it. I would, like John, want to acknowledge my wife, Jenny, who put up with a heck of a lot to get me up there. We certainly appreciate y'all coming out here today. Thank you. President Reagan sent congratulations to the astronauts for putting, quote, new worlds within closer reach and more knowledge within our grasp. We'll be back in a moment with more of the congratulations that the astronauts received. Well, night has descended on the desert here at Edwards Air Force Base in California, and night means that the temperature drops very rapidly, and as you can see, perhaps the wind gets up. The ability to fly the same spaceship repeatedly into orbit may not seem like all that much to some laymen, but to the knowledgeable, it's a giant leap forward. We at CBS News have had the benefit of some of the knowledgeable, indeed experts, in our coverage of the Space Shuttle's maiden mission. With me are former astronaut Alan Bean and veteran test pilot Leo Krupp. With Morton Dean in Houston, astronaut Jack Lausman. Gentlemen, let's talk about this mission and its meaning. 
first in Houston, Colonel Lauschman. Well, Dan, uh, thank you. We, of course, uh, needed this mission uh, to be successful, and it certainly was. We're ecstatic about it here in Houston. But uh, from the further point of view, of course, uh, we need the space program. We cannot afford to do without it. We have a lot of benefits that uh, result from the space program uh, that are aimed mainly at improving our quality of life here on Earth. It's more than just a great adventure, a box of rocks. It's for the people of our nation and of the world. First of all, I think we need it for our own national security. It has also, on the other hand, been a perfect opportunity to open up channels of international communication around the world. We can uh, learn how to manage and utilize our resources more effectively and more efficiently. We can learn how to find new ones. We need it for weather forecasting and for communications. There are just a variety of benefits for the, from the space program and the, the ultimate objective, as I mentioned, is to improve the quality of life here on Earth. And that's the basic objective. It always has been. It always will be. And the space shuttle exploits that. Jack, I think there's a uh, psychological factor at play here. America really needed a vict a victory after the war and Watergate, uh, after the problem with inflation and all the worry about the uh, oil running out and that sort of thing. A victory was really needed. And perhaps the uh, shuttle flight was indeed that victory. I think that uh, perhaps to play devil's advocate, uh, it's still going to take a while before we realize whether the shuttle is the long-term answer to America's role in space. I think it'll take a while to prove out whether or not the shuttle is the low-cost uh, vehicle that will carry American satellites into space and will prove to be the vehicle that American communications companies want to use. And I suppose also that the scientists and the engineers in Houston and in Florida still have to take a close-up look at that vehicle to determine whether it really did what it was supposed to do. But uh, I'm not throwing a damper on today's celebration. It was a momentous occasion. It was a historic occasion, and I think almost every American is uh, proud of it. Dan? Leo Krupp, your thoughts about the meaning of this mission? Well, Dan, it's been six years since we had a man in space, and today we started business again. And. Uh, we finally qualified our DC-3 of the space age in the shuttle, and we're going to put it to work, and it's going to do a lot of useful work for the nation and for the world. And I don't think anyone can project right now what the final missions are going to be. It'd be like asking the Wright brothers after their flight at Kitty Hawk what was going to happen to the airplane. I'm sure no one at that period of time would have ever been able to imagine the progress that aviation has made and that we can now fly across the Atlantic and the Pacific and, and airlines and. Uh, it's the same way with the shuttle. No one really can anticipate at this time what this airplane will do for us, but I, I can say with all certainty that it's going to do a terrific job and it's going to keep us in space and it's going to keep this country at the forefront of technology. Al Bean. Well, Buck Rogers is now. It's that simple. Uh, John Young, Bob Crippen, and, and all of us, all Americans, everybody that watched this, lived the dream that uh, all of us, uh, all the people young and hard had ever since they've read about Buck Rogers in the comic book. We saw it lived out the last uh, two days or so, incredible. Um, you know, I think one thing, we, many people were surprised by how well this mission went. Uh, I think we ought to realize as Americans, we've got a tradition of excellence. We've done things right in this world all along, and we're the only, we're the only country that can do this kind of thing. There's no other country in the world that can do this. And, uh, we ought to expect it. We ought to demand it. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, the taxpayers are getting their money right now. They're seeing what this uh, investment of 10 years' effort can give. And uh, I believe they're going to be uh, feeling good about themselves, feeling good about NASA, and just saying, you know, uh, this is a pretty good world. This is a pretty good country. It's, it's nice to be here. It's nice to be part of Buck Rogers. For myself, thinking about the possible meaning of this Space Odyssey 1981, among the meanings, America's vision of itself as the frontier country, still a new country. Our history is that of frontier people. It's a saying that you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. America's own vision of itself and the vision other people have of us is of a country that's always pushing out to the new frontier. And the new frontier is that high frontier. Thank you, gentlemen. The space agency today named the astronauts for the next shuttle flight. 
It's also to be made in the Columbia and is tentatively planned for late August or September. Those astronauts are Air Force Colonel Joe Engel, 48 years old, of Abilene, Kansas, and Navy Captain Richard Truly, 43 years old, of Fayette, Mississippi. Both military test pilots, but neither has flown in space. Just 20 miles south of the windblown Edwards Air Force Base tonight, a second shuttle, Challenger, is under construction in a Rockwell International hangar. Construction is expected to begin within a year or so on two more, Discovery and Atlantis. All that's ahead, given impetus by an almost flawless first mission of the space shuttle. For my colleagues here in Houston, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and elsewhere, Dan Rather, CBS News, Edwards Air Force Base in California. Thank you and good night.